Nice to meet you. I'm new to Sydney, so please introduce yourselves to me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I need more friends, more friends than my parents. Um, okay. Quit. If you're a creative person who isn't working in technology at the moment, quit. Trade your reality for our virtual reality. Replace yourself with an algorithm. Architect information instead of buildings. Quit. If you're a creative person that's not working in technology at the moment, quit. Because from our perspective, you can't be creative without us. Your job, like most others around the city, is built for an economy that's faltering, an, an old economy that our grandparents and our parents perfected, but is now wrinkling with their skin. What's the formula? It's actually quite primitive. It was built during a time when the internet looked like this. Corporations produced physical, standardized products, launched them in seasonal campaigns, and advertised them through mass media. The formula operated a lot like war because it was invented immediately after the one we had with Hitler. War heroes came home, they took the manufacturing principles of Henry Ford and implemented them with superior technology. Shit exploded. They produce more goods in shorter and shorter and shorter amounts of time. A sudden flush of fridges, air conditioners, cars, soda, just hit the streets. Our markets became supermarkets. Our shops needed centers and plazas. All thanks to the productivity of factory hands. A factory worker in 1975 could produce twice as much as the same worker in 1946, twice as much per hour. You could literally, at the time, look back and say, I'm twice the man you are. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine producing 4% more per hour each year for three decades. You'd get more than a promotion. You'd lift a whole generation into the middle class and spark an age of golden capitalism and consumerism. That's how the corporations that we work for came to the top of the Fortune 500 list in the old economy. Not through creativity, but through productivity. They replaced slow humans with fast machines. And they put the leftover workers under the gun. They replaced the warm smile of shopkeepers with the bright claims of advertising. They sought out the biggest audiences they could buy on TVs, blimps, and billboards. Were they creative? Absolutely not. They were not. Each seasonal campaign introduced these tiny, little, microscopic changes to products, announced with big, massive, bold announcements. A new flavor, a different logo, a cup holder. All of these things at one time have been called the next big thing. You can see it on the ads right now. The next big thing is a cup holder. Each day, they'd arrive at the office and repeat their corporate mantra, corporate mantra, and this is official, what is the smallest change we can make to our products that will cause the biggest change in demand? What's the smallest change we can make to our products that will cause the biggest change in demand? It's written on the walls, it's on sticky notes, next to their typewriters. That was their kickoff meeting. They didn't have they didn't have creative mornings, they had productive ones. The other day someone told me that Woolworths Supermarket, Woolworths Supermarket was one of the most creative companies in Australia. The fresh food people. <laughs> I'm not going to take lessons in creativity from an organization who thinks a walk-in cheese room in Double Bay is groundbreaking. 
That shouldn't even have broken news. If you have a job that's in any way fed by these old organizations, just remember that they have productive mornings, not creative ones. And once they have a stranglehold on the wave, they're going to ride it all the way to shore, as long as they can. Most car makers caught their wave in 1914. That was the peak year for new entrants into the car market. Remember the formula. They didn't make their cars better and better and better. They made their factories better and better and better. We're left pelting down the M4 in drive trains and engines that were conceived 100 years ago. Internal combustion engines are like Kyle and Jackie O. They suck and nobody's getting rid of them. <laughs> Meanwhile, the factories that make our cars are like something out of the matrix. They employ more robots than they do humans. If our cars improved the same way our factories did, they'd be whizzing around the windows like the Nebuchadnezzar. In the 50s, General Motor, a General Motor employee could make seven cars per year. By the 90s, they could make 13. And today, they can make 28. But do we need more of the same Cadillacs? No, we don't. I'm guessing if Mother Nature is going to be the judge, she'd want something a little different, something that runs on alternative energy, something that doesn't contribute to congestion. Flies. Pardon? Something that flies. Something that flies. <laughs> I thought you said lies. <laughs> <laughs> Point of information, <laughs> <Did, laughs> something that didn't pollute. But that's just a guess. I can't speak for Mother Nature. The fresh food people, GM, all the companies that we work for, these are not a creative clan. They see the pilot in every grand plot. We should all learn to hate pilots. I'm sure you guys already hate them already. Pilots say we acknowledge something is correct, but we don't have the guts to go all in. Pilots are commitment issues with the future. Pilots placate progress. So who wants to spend the rest of their life doing pilots? Not me, and I don't think you want to either. So quit. Come join the technology industry, an industry where Amazon.com not only changes, it changes 11 times per second. An industry where Uber, which started as a ride-sharing app during the day, by night is spending all its extra time and money trying to build autonomous cars. A ride-sharing app now has the opportunity and the will and the want to build autonomous cars in its spare time. An industry where Facebook has attracted billions of users, a billion, a little bit more than a billion user, not multiples, without one single advertisement, not one. An industry where a Tesla you bought in 2008 can receive a software update from the cloud and then go 80% further in range. That's the industry that you should come and join. So here's a PSA from our Lord and Savior, pre-skivvy Steve Jobs. <laughs> it is kind of messed up in a lot of ways. And yes, we are just as smart, if not smarter, than the fresh food people. <laughs> but it always wasn't so silly or erroneous to think that it was difficult to change the world, to think that if we push something, it would just push back, or we might even break our finger. That always wasn't the case. Starting a computer company like Apple back in the day wasn't easy at all. It was really, really, really hard. It was really hard to be in technology. You needed PhDs on staff. You need a, a super nerd sidekick like Steve Wozniak. You needed to invent things, typically under the watchful eye of a government R&D grant. You need, to keep, you need to compete against giants like IBM. IBM had an entire law, law firm at the time inside its walls to sue and be sued. So anything you made had to go up against a massive 
massive company. You add competition from the Japanese, which is always scary. You needed to be Steve Jobs to be Steve Jobs. The good news is that that's no longer the case today for us. It might have been the case for the internet, but now it's not. And here's why. Software. Heisenberg cooked up this really cheap, easy to use, addictive, really accessible drug called software. It's a gateway drug to the rest of the high-tech industry. With software, you don't need resources and manufacturing plants. You can build it from a coffee shop. You can build a software product from a coffee shop. Facebook was built from a dorm room. Dorm room, rather. You can learn code in a month. Sure, your output might be, not be glistening with a craftsman's perfection, but you're going to get it right over, the time, over time. Twitter wasn't glistening. Facebook wasn't glistening. You can launch your shitty product into the world and perfect it over time in public, getting better and better and better and better. Your products get better and better and better and better, and your keyboard is the factory. Moreover, in software, people build things for you for free. So a programmer who's invented a creation is going to share it with you in an online open source community so you can take the Lego piece and implement it into your own thing. There's no R&D labs. There's no patents. There's no IP. It's just in the public, people sharing and trading ideas to build software. If you build something people want, then it's practically free to launch it, to distribute it. In the old economy, to distribute media and content, you needed paper mills, radio spectrums, you needed prime time slots, you needed trucks, you needed roads, you needed ships, you need merchandising. After the internet, we don't need all that stuff. We can click, share, like, tweet, retweet, and that's how we get our users, virtually for free. The cost is, can you build something that people want? That's the new cost. But most importantly, and this is the final point, is that within technology, a premium is placed on your creativity. The catch with software being so easy to make is that it's hard to defend. The moment you release a product, it can be copied, open sourced, bought by another company, or redone by a cashed up team at Google. Software depreciates faster than a Cadillac. That's why creativity comes at a premium inside the software industry. Your belief stack matters more than your technology stack. Sure, you have the right to bombard your users with pop-up ads, but is it the right thing to do? That's a creative decision. Sure, Flickr can legally sell photos that are under the Creative Commons, but is that the right thing to do? That's a creative decision. Sure, OkCupid can target emails based on attractiveness. So if you're attractive, you're only seeing other attractive people. But is that the right thing to do? Sure, Apple can round its corners on its icons. Creative decision, but is that the right thing to do? It's picking between these creative decisions. Those are the most important part of the technology industry. When the actual software guts of the things that you're working on are just shapes and boxes and things that have been reappropriated and copied from open source libraries and other people. Think about it. Why would Facebook buy WhatsApp for $19 billion? Why would they buy a thing they could make for $19 billion? What makes WhatsApp different? Is it the technology? No. The software guts of WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook Manage Messenger, all those messenger services are basically built on the same open source libraries and pre-built pre uh, features that they've combined and recombined. If you had a talented developer, you could rebuild WhatsApp in a week. And that's a thing worth $19 billion. So what was it? What, was, what went into it? What intellectual property went into it that made it so, so valuable? It was the guts of the founders, not the guts of the software. The guts for them to say, no, 
to gimmicks, the guts for them to say no to advertising, the guts for them to say no to games, to be a pure messaging service, the guts for them to not collect data on their users. Those creative decisions, decisions that were you know, unattainable and unapproachable to Facebook because of their creative direction, something that they could have that Facebook couldn't. They were so friendly to users that they made Facebook look evil or eviler, depending on your perspective. Moreover, if you join the technology industry and you quit, if you happen to be successful, your creation can spawn a whole new economy. And not just within the technology industry, but also outside of it. For each new job in technology, an additional five jobs are created in outside sectors. So one software engineer at Twitter will create a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, a yoga teacher, and a driver. Jobs in technology have the largest multiplier effect on other jobs, three times that of manufacturing. So when you build a search engine, that pound for pound, pound for pound, is creating more jobs than building an aircraft engine. Also, once a new technology is in the market, a whole new class of jobs are created around it to support it. People love to ridicule, in the business media especially, the fact that Twitter doesn't make any revenue. Twitter doesn't make any revenue. Twitter doesn't need to make any revenue, does it want to make any revenue, just because it's gone public. But it has created a lot of social media matter jobs, right? If you look at the studies, they show that Facebook app developers have directly created around 53,000 jobs and indirectly created about 190,000 jobs in related business services. Some other figures here. In 2014, iOS, iOS app developers earned more than Hollywood did in the box office in the US. So those $1 apps that you're playing on your phone during movies, those are making more monies monies than the movies themselves. Last year, the app economy sustained more jobs than the film industry. 600,000 iOS jobs in comparison to 370,000 jobs in Hollywood. So this is my message to you guys. Quit. Come join the technology industry and set the new rules for a new economy. We need more people like you. Trust me. We need more diverse people, people from untraditional backgrounds. We don't need another Google. We need a different Google. Another Zuckerberg would be nice, right? But another Garcia, another Camacho, another Mong would, Wong rather, would be even better. I miss Garcia. I miss Wong. I miss Camacho. A black Googler at the moment is as rare as a black president. 2%, not even. As many black presidents as there were in portion to all presidents, there are black employees at Google. So we need these untraditional minds. We need new people to join, to have these new creative things, people who aren't disconnected from the smells and emotions of life, people who come from art, people who come from business, people who come from all sorts of things to get into software, and we've made it easy for you to come in. So come, we need creative people. We need people who have creative mornings, not productive ones. Thank you.